You are listening to the Experience 50 Podcast for Midlife. I'm your host, Mary Rogers. This is episode 170. Welcome, everybody, to the show. Oh, we're going to have a whole lot of fun today, and this is a first. I've been doing lots of firsts lately. Last week, we did our first video podcast for the folks over on Patreon. Today, I am interviewing two people at the same time within the same podcast. So hopefully, the tech is all going to work on this, and we'll just see what happens, because if this goes well... I really dig this idea of having two different people in two different places in the world talking here with you and me. So here's the deal. I was contacted by a woman who had written her memoir. And, you know, I'm all about shaping your story, creating your story when you're in midlife. And so this woman who got in touch, her name is Kimba Delfries. Actually, Kimba is just to her friends. Her her authoring name is Kim. But she wrote her memoir, which goes all the way back. And it has turned into a book, which is called I Was in Love with a Short Man Once. So I have I listened to the audible version of this book. It was hilarious fun. It was You know, I just love hanging out with people who are about my age because we all have those same common little threads in growing up. So we're going to be talking with Kimba about this memoir that she wrote. But here is the bonus. I listened to the audible version of her book. And how fun is this? We have the woman who was the narrator of the story with us as well. Turns out that Amanda Newcomb, who is the narrator, she and Kim have become these great friends. And so they're both on with us. And we're just first I want to dive in and speak with Kim, also known as Kimba. Hey, Kimba, welcome to the Experience 50 podcast for midlife. So glad that you're here. Thank you. And so you're I'm about to be here. Thanks. You're about to have a birthday, right? I am. What's it going to be? <laughs> I'm going to be 56. Well, welcome to the 56 club because that's exactly where I am. Outstanding. Yeah. It's welcome a great, to the sisterhood. Yeah. It's a great year. It's 56 is good. So for, let me ask you, is there a big difference between 55 and 56? Yeah. Cause you're on the other side of the middle. Oh, okay. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> I don't right. know. It did. It definitely did. Co- I mean, but it's not like you get extra discounts anywhere or anything like that. So it's just that you're on the other side of that hill, I guess. But I'm good with it because yeah. I'm loving life in my 50s. So let's talk about the story that you wrote, which is your story. And this is something that I talk to people about all the time, even if they're not publishing their story. You know, if they're just kind of writing it in their head for themselves or through journaling, did you find that when you were telling your story, which is a lot of little stories, that you kind of had to decide what is my overall attitude? What is my perspective? Like, how, because you could tell the same set of stories in a million different ways. How did you choose your voice, so to speak? Well, it, it, you know, it's interesting because when I started, I didn't start with that filter. I started with um, looking through the types of essays that I wanted to write from different points in my life. And then a theme started to emerge, but it, I didn't filter it at first. I just was like, I'm going to write, I'm going to figure it out later. And then the the theme of sort of coming up stories, my uh, what I call Jimmy stories, and then the rest of the stories that started to emerge as a theme going throughout the book. And so it's all yeah. written in first person. You're telling these different stories that are presented chronologically, going back to being a little kid. And I have to tell you, what when I, I knew I was hooked on the story when you started talking about junior high. That's a universal theme. And even when my son went through middle school, you know, a team decades later, he was dealing with some of the same things that you have to deal with going through middle school, sort of the, the sort of emotional bullying and 
Um, not that he had a, actually a good experience in middle school, but there's it's just this hierarchy that starts to develop and the, these crazy cliques that evolve and um, how, and, but in particular, how girls can be vicious to each other. That's universal. It's not necessarily just for women in middle age, but I've had, you know, women who are in their early 20s now say, yeah, I absolutely identified with what happened to you in middle school. You also point out in the book that your brother, Scotty, does not want you sharing his stories. And this is really interesting. When I have read work by other authors, there's there's a woman by the name of Roz Warren, who I follow, and she spilled the whole dirty story of her husband cheating on her and their divorce and all the awful things that he did, even though she changed his name. And and she talks now about who owns this story. And she claims, Mm -hmm. it's my story, damn it. I'm sorry if you don't look good in it. I'll change your name. But it's I own I own that story because it happened to me. So how did you go through the writing process of essays about your life that when you know, in their totality become a memoir? How did you decide which stories you owned? You know, it's so funny. Amanda and I were just talking about this last week because she was curious, too, about what do you put in the book and what don't you put in the book? And my filter was that if it's if it happened to me directly and if I had a point of view that resonates within that story, then it was mine to tell. I spent a lot of time in the beginning of the book actually talking about uh, a background of my parents. And that I was only able to tell stories that involved me and my parents. So, for example, there was this great family story about how my dad had supposedly beat up uh, an a actor, a famous actor, yeah, and uh, George Hamilton. And it wasn't tr- it not being true, but also it wasn't my story to tell. Like it's just I would love to talk about what the fifties were like and what it was like, you know, growing up in the fifties. But I that's not that my dad should write that story. Right. Or it, you know, but it's not mine to tell where I struggled was telling stories about my son when he was young, because they are my stories, but they also are from his perspective. And you struggle with how much information do you want to share about your children? So it's an interesting dynamic that you have to think about when you're going back in time and telling stories about people in your past. I actually know Ron Warren, who you mentioned. Oh, okay. And yeah, you do struggle with how much should you reveal? But at the same time, it, you know, you have to consider if it's your perspective, right? I have some stories in my book that involve my ex-husband and they're funny. I mean, they're not, they're not, I don't consider them disparaging, but I went the extra step of changing some names, keeping in perspective that he might not necessarily want those shared, but like Roz, they're my stories to tell. And so I feel like I own them. Um, but you do have to pay attention to things like libel and slander as well. And don't, as a writer, you don't want to get yourself in trouble where you're writing something about someone that, that they can come back at you later. Well, and you also write an awesome blog, which is called The Middle-Aged Cheap Seats. And so I imagine that you're also writing, uh, you know, pretty personal stuff. I, I think with a blog, it's a, it's evolved in a way, it's almost always from my perspective, and sometimes I bring in like best friends. And what's really funny is that I have a set of best friends where I have one, Danny, who she's like, yeah, use my name. Absolutely. Throw it out there. I have other girlfriends that they don't necessarily want me to use their their real name. So I check in with them, like just because I think it's funny and I want everybody in the world to know my stuff doesn't mean that everybody else feels that way. Oh, yeah. Well, I know when I was Mary in the morning doing, you know, four hours of talk radio in my home, in my little local town, my husband is a very private person. And I had been told by my program director, the more willing you are to pull back the curtain on your private life, the more successful this show is going to be. And so, you know, I had a little, you know, I had a family who were hilarious to talk about, but they are very private people. And so my husband became known as Mr. Danger, and which then somehow <laughs> somehow evolved into Captain Danger. But that was just how he was <laughs> always referred to on the show. So I could talk about him and he could lead his life in this small town. And it worked out. Right. 
pretty darn well. So the book was published in June of 2019. And I'd love to hear what were you hoping to give your readers and what is the response that you've gotten back? Because I did (laughs) what I loved on Amazon is the little preview of the book. This is what it says, and then you can answer my question. Have you ever wondered if the life of the woman standing next to you in the checkout line is as weird as yours? Could it be possible you're trapped in a bizarre reality show where the object of the game is to get the crazy lady to flip out just one more time? Love that. Who wouldn't be hooked on reading that. So what were you hoping to deliver and what has been the response? It's interesting because when I first started, what I really wanted to deliver was an idea of what it was like growing up in Florida, but then also evolving into being a single mom for a while and then to evolve past that. But what it turned out to be is love song for my gal pals and that chronicling shared experiences that women often have that when you get to a certain point in your life, you look back and you realize, wow, I, when you listen to your girlfriends, we all kind of had similar experience. This is what you mentioned earlier about middle school and how um, I actually, this is what, what one of my favorite stories to share. I was really worried that I may have been a mean girl in middle school as well. And it, it's always haunted me that I hope that I didn't treat anybody the way that I describe Agnes treating me. And I had someone from middle school actually contact me, a woman that I hadn't even remembered, who wanted to let me know that I had been very kind to her in middle school. And that she wanted, she said, I don't know if you remember, but I was new and you invited me to sit with you at lunch. And I barely even remembered that, but that was so significant for her in middle school that she wanted to reach out and let me know that that had made a difference to her. So in terms of what I wanted to get out of it, that was like a giant surprise. I was like, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't a nasty person in middle school. I actually was kind of nice to some people. (laughs) Um, So what I get out of it now is that I've had connections with other women who read the book and like, oh, this happened to me, or this didn't happen to me, or this is what it was like when I had to drop my, my, my first born off at college. And that's been crazy rewarding is that people that I don't even know contacting me and letting me know, hey, me too, right? Um, But in the funnest sort of way. I think that's awesome. And that's, you know what, this is my goal with my podcast with Experience 50 is that I find that both men and women are going through this experience and they're not talking about it or they don't have friends. They don't, somehow they got to this age And they forgot to have friends that had nothing to do with their kids, nothing to do with maybe the spouse that has left them. And they just are so hungry for a connection and stories of exactly what you put in your book. I just, I really enjoyed the book. I listened to it. I didn't read it, which is tough for me. Isn't that weird? I love podcasts, but there's something about books I like to hold. I I just loved the connection I felt with you in how you told your stories. And now I will share with my audience kind of the whack-a-doodle-doo part of this is. <laughs> so the whole story on in the Audible version is told by a different woman with a different voice. And she's with us right now, Amanda Newcomb, who is the narrator of the book in the voice of Kim Delfries. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm so glad that you are here. So you are a professional, you know, broadcast industry veteran. You have a business doing professional voiceover work. And so how did you connect, either one of you? How did you find each other? Oh, oh, can I please tell this? This is one of my favorite stories. Okay, this is oh, by Kim. The way, I had the in full disclosure, the the book is in ebook and paperback as well. And we decided that we wanted to go uh, use a company to go through Audible. And I uploaded it and talked to the producers. And the process is that you have people who audition. It's that you, you post a, a snippet of your book 
and that then different uh, voiceover artists give you an audition. And so I had noted that I wanted somebody with a Southern accent. So, and it, I know you're going to laugh because I don't have a Southern accent. Well, I have one, but it only shows up when I'm either drunk or tired. But I wanted someone with a Southern accent. And I kept getting these auditions where the Southern accent just did not sound authentic. And it was just not, it wasn't a good fit. But I had finally found someone that I thought I wanted to go with. And this one last uh, audition comes in and my husband is sitting with me and so is my girlfriend, Danielle. And they're like, well, I just listen to this one before you decide. And I listened to it and it was Amanda. And I'm like, oh my God, she nailed it. Like, I can't believe how perfect she is for this. Immediately accepted her, like, please, please narrate my book. And that's how we got started. So it was very serendipitous, last minute. You think you've made a decision. And then all of a sudden, fake karma in the universe, like throws this other option in. And I went with Amanda and it's been fantastic. And Amanda is the most authentic narrator you could possibly have. Like there was, there's nothing fake about it. She back up a little bit, just the yeah. audition process. I have a story too. So we had come back from vacation. We had gone to Disney world <laughs> and it was crazy and hectic. But while I was there, I picked up a cold, a really bad one. And when we got back, look and see what's available on Audible for auditions, who's accepting. And so I saw the, I was in love with a short man once and I'm like, well, so was I, <laughs> cause I'm really tall too. So, <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I get that, you know, and the Southern thing, um, I have a, a, a mutt background. It's, it's, it's Irish, it's Scottish, it's English, it's, you know, but the Southern thing, I, I have that down to a T. So when I auditioned Kim, I don't know if you remember listening to that audition, I had a cold and my voice was deeper. It was, you know, a little more nasally, but I'm like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to go ahead and send this in. And because that's me. And I, I only hadn't had a chance to read the book yet. I just had the script. I'm like, I identified with it. I got into it. So Amanda, what is it like getting into someone else's head? Because because how you say something, how you present the words, how you choose the emphasis for different words and the attitude and is this sassy, is this sentimental? How do you do that? Well, it, I'm a, that was so easy because it just, those stories resonated with me. Uh, and, and I think it would a lot of women, uh, whether you're from the South or not. I mean, it's, it's just, it was just a simple slide right in. And because I felt like a lot of those stories I had experienced myself. So I was just telling it in a different way. So um that hope that answers your question, but uh, well, you had a connection. I mean, just because I do think this book really speaks to people, and it's easy to connect. When but you're 46, 45? 45, 45. Yeah. I'm the baby sister of this of the sisterhood here. Yes, you are. You know what? Most of my listeners are between forty five and fifty four, so you are. You can now listen. I can now give you permission to listen to the Experience Fifty okay. podcast. I was a little scared that I, you know, to tell you my age. So oh, no, 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 no. No, sweetie, you're okay. You're safe here. I, But I do think these are stories that just resonate. And this is where I want to go with the conversation. So after you spent as much time as I'm sure you did in recording this and also speaking with Kim offline and getting to know her, I understand the two of you have become great friends. Absolutely. Well, it's just a lot of, a lot in common. And Telling her story, I felt like it was my story too, in a way, because of the, the similar experience, especially when you're talking about the free lunch chapter with middle school. Oh, that was such a, that was a, the worst time. It sucked. It just sucked. Middle school. It was just so easy. I don't know how to explain. I've had other books that I've done where it's, it's very difficult. But with Kim, it was just so easy. Uh, Amanda, can I tell her one of our favorite editing stories? Oh, yes, absolutely. She was very dedicated to quality and she would send me each chapter and we would review it. But there was one chapter, there was a part that Amanda just could not get through. She kept laughing. And so she actually sent me the blooper of it because we had gone through it so often. There's a chapter in the book called Jezebel. And uh, if you recall, it's when I was in college 
and uh, my sort of my alter ego got named and the story around what she did one night with with a friend of hers and there's a the capital of Florida when it got remade the old one now the beautiful antebellum building still sits in front of it but behind it is the new capital which has two domes on each side and on the left is the house the right is the senate and then there's a 22 story building in the middle and if you're from Florida you know that it's called Askew Directions because it was Governor Askew who had um, who had facilitated this building this building being being built. And anyway, Amanda got stuck and could not say ask you direction. And it was so <laughs> funny because she she literally had like 12 takes and she just kept laughing more and more each time. And it was just so much fun to, to work with her and be like, all right, girl, you need to get your, your stuff together. You've got to be able to say this. And she finally got through it. But even the last take, there's still a little bit of a giggle in there because she just couldn't get through the whole thing oh without without being able to laugh. That's great. Now, have the two of you met in person? No, we have not. We want to. And we actually live in the same state. So we're going to we're going to fix that eventually. That's but so, we have not met in person. Oh, that's mm-hmm. so interesting. And and isn't it awesome that in 2019, women, well, I guess and guys, but it's definitely more of a chick thing. We can connect and become great friends with other people that we've never met. I mean, just through phone calls and Skyping or FaceTiming, it can be a very intense relationship. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I have a group of women through the Irma Bobbeck workshop that I've only seen in person over the past five years, three times. Yeah. And yet there's some of my closest women friends. Like we, we stay in close contact. We talk all the time and we chat over Facebook chat all the time and talk about our writing process and what's going on in our lives. And I consider them really good friends. When you find women that you can connect with and you have a genuine relationship with, I also find as you get older, you tend to hold on to those because you know that they're rare. Do you I guys agree. agree? Oh, I Absolutely. completely agree. And we, in fact, my husband and I have this theory, which we have shared with both of our adult children, which is this. When you are dating someone and considering a long-term or relationship or getting married to them is how many friends do they have that go way back that it, it's yeah. really a good sign of an emotionally, you know, healthy person. If they have friends from mm-hmm. grade school, it means they can weather stuff together. Yeah. That's- I think that's an excellent litmus test for sure. And if they don't have any friends head for the Hills. <laughs> yeah maybe right? yeah for sure my mother always said that you can you can judge a person by their friends so always be careful who you hang out with I think <laughs> you know, she told me like, growing yeah. up you're getting in the wrong crowd or not getting the wrong crowd or you know, your friends good influences and bad influences and she she was like look you will be judged on on who you hang out with so if you're if, if you if you meet someone they don't have any friends that's a bad sign. It is. That's a really bad sign. Well, yeah. well, and I also think this is really good advice for women at our age. If you are not living the life that feels exciting to you and what you want to be all about, look around. And who are you hanging out with? You know, who are the five yeah. people you spend the most time with? And start adding in some new people and, you know, I think we all have weird ideas about, well, I my friends need to be this kind of person and get some people who are not that kind of person. You know, I mean, stretch a little. Absolutely. I, I do want to go back and mention on the whole Jezebel thing. My alter ego is Mavis. <laughs> I want to hear about Mavis. <laughs> Ma- Mavis. Well, and, and me and my group of girlfriends, we all have our alter ego names. And when we want to say something a little harsh, you know, to one of our friends, it's, all right, this is Mavis talking. Honey, you need to leave that man. Do you know what I mean? Because I, <laughs> then we're not completely accountable for what we say. Oh, um, right. Yeah. Oh, Amanda, right. do you have an alter ego name? I do. <laughs> really? Yeah. What is it? it? it it's. It's Amanda, which is um, a combination of Evander and Evander. <laughs> Amanda. 
because of one bar fight. It was one bar fight and a fight. one of a my fight. friends Did you just decided to call me because I get, if that's why I don't drink, I get scrappy. <laughs> so, a little scrappy. And, and not, <laughs> not, that, not that I start anything, but if someone starts something, you know, I, and this, I was in my twenties. I was young. I was mortified afterwards because I'd never done anything like that. Yeah. And, you know, but you know, the girl, she, 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 wanted she wanted an altercation with somebody and I just happened to be the person she honed in on and it didn't end well for her and one of my friends ended up calling me Xander and <laughs> so oh I love that I do it's too with yeah all yeah for you know, 25 years now yeah so. well and you know what there are times when I know I need to bring Mavis out because Mary can't be the person she wants to be right now yeah, Amanda is that person who will who will tell you like it is, whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it, you can, you know, you save it for Amanda when she comes back. Right. Well, Amanda <laughs> will stick up for herself no matter what. Right? That's right. And I'll stick up for anybody else that's in my my pack. In your in my posse. Tribe of people. You know, if Kim if Kim called me today and said, I'm having trouble with this person, I would drive up there three and a half hours <laughs> <laughs> and just to just to, you know. Let them have it. <laughs> I have mixed feelings on whether or not Amanda and Jezebel should ever meet. I, I think it could be great fun. I think we could also end up in jail. It's very possible. Well, I think that would make for another great book, right? Yeah. Oh, most likely. Most likely. Excellent. All right. So I do want to go back. Kim, okay. Can you share with my listeners the story about free lunch in middle school? Because I... I would just love for you to kind of give a synopsis of of that part of your life. So like most girls going into middle school, um, the transition from elementary school to middle school, I had the same friends, at least I thought I did. And uh, my best friend in elementary school was a woman that I call Agnes. And um, when we got to middle school, Agnes became like just my worst enemy. She just became hateful and vindictive. And because um, I came from a family that didn't have a lot of money uh, back in the 70s when um, the free lunch program was being implemented, uh, the way that they would keep tabs for their accounting is that everybody else got green tickets. But if you were on free lunch or um, assisted, you know, they helped with your, the cost, you got a red ticket. And Agnes figured it out. And she let everybody know that those of us who had red tickets were poor. And she and it was miserable. I mean, she just was cutthroat and just started all these horrible rumors about how poor we were and what that how that impacted me as a as a young teenager. Well, in middle school, there everyone has a red ticket story. It doesn't have to be free lunch. It's the fact right. that you were wearing the wrong kind of jeans or you even talked yeah. about like IZOD shirts. And I mean, what you were wearing in middle school was, a, well, what, which we called junior high back then was exactly right. the same uniform of preppy, preppy clothes that I wore. If you didn't um, have it, if it wasn't from the sa- the right store or the right brand, oh my God, it was devastating. It's kind of like a rite of passage, and I hate that it's still that way, but we did not have social media. Like, you, you know, you had to survive it, but it could be kind of contained within a small group. But social media now has made mean girl bullying at a whole different level. Oh. And trying to stay in front of that and in this day and age. So I think that what we lived through back in the, in the early mid-70s was tough. But I think that what young girls and boys, but what young children are living through in middle school now is a whole different level of bullying. I um, I have a 19 year old daughter, so she has grown up with it and lived with it. And mm, there are yeah. a number of yeah, it was, other young ladies in this community that I would like to throttle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if I may say yeah, so. It, 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 I, I wish I could just reach back and say, you don't have to be like this. I know you think you do, but you don't have to behave this way. You need to be supporting other girls. And I just don't know why we can't seem to get past that and, you know, and get through to these clicks don't work. This disempowering other girls doesn't work. 
Yeah. Um, but we just don't seem to have it figured out. Well, we're it, we're supposed to be in this third wave of feminism. And I'm hoping that there will be a fourth wave um, very, very soon that will be about how women treat each other. Yeah. Because it ain't happening yet. I mean, me too, whatever. No. Um, this is not part of the conversation. Can I interject? Please do. Amanda, what, what are you, what's your... <laughs> I, okay, so when it came to the free lunch chapter, and I'm reading this, and it all, you know, it, it, it resonates with, you know, 99% of young girls out there. And that voice that I use for Agnes <laughs> is a mimic of my Agnes <gasps> back in high school. So when I was in high school, and this carried on because it's a small town. I mean, it's, it's, there's... Our, my graduating class was 89 students. You know, we grew up together. So that stuff didn't just stop at junior high. It kept right on up through graduation. And at graduation, we have what's called the seniors last will and testaments. And the other, this clique is the one who writes all of these, right? So they write all of our, the rest of us little people's last will and testaments. And ah. And, and mine was kind of just, I was taller than all the other girls in school. I'm, I'm five, nine. It's, it's very thin. I was still, you know, I think I came into my own, my senior year, but we were, we didn't have money. My mom was a single mom. My father passed away. She's got three girls she's raising on her own. She's working full time. So we had, you know, I couldn't wear those clothes that you're talking about. Those, the eyes odds and the, all the, the Levi's and, you know, that were real big back then. And we just couldn't afford it. So the last, the, the last comment for me as a senior coming from this clique of girls was in the future, Amanda will be making millions modeling for Kmart. Oh, Ooh. and that hurt on a oh. level. I can't even, I can't even convey. And, you know, and that's okay because I took that woman's voice or that girl's voice. And that was Agnes. You know what this means, don't you? It means you're poor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was so. That was her. So, Amanda, was that was that cathartic for you? It was. Yeah, so they, it was a little bit. Ironically, um, um, she uh, friended me on Facebook, and you accepted her. Oh yeah, because I wanted to see how good it is. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh good, good for you. Um, I will say it was no. it was no. very it was no. very cathartic to write free lunch. But my regret is I don't know what happened to Agnes because people have said, have you connected with her? Do you know how her life turned out? Like I, I lost contact with her. I don't know. And they're like, well, you should know that if she reads this, she'll know it's her. I'm oh, like, of course. I'm not so sure she would. If she friended me on Facebook, I don't know if I'd be able to accept that. Like good for you to be able to do that. But I don't know if I could do that. I, I just did it as a petty revenge thing. <laughs> oh, well then, then it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Then. You know, yeah. and and it is funny that, you know, a lot of, the, a lot of us to those girls, you know, they're, they get in those clicks and they get mean and then they do regret it as they get older. You know? yeah. Well, all right. I, so you know. I will voice in now. I will chime in as the one who gets older and regrets it. <gasps> you were that oh, girl. Really? Well, so I, really? well, so first let me say that I was on the receiving end a plenty. And so I absolutely sure. relate to your stories of girls that just were so ruthless and so horrible to me. But going and that was more like junior high and high school. But going back to grade school, there was a a girl who was kind of everybody's target. She was extremely overweight. She was always at least a foot taller than anyone else in the class. And the poor thing, just she was the common target. And I don't think I, I mean, I can't even really remember a specific event where I was unkind, but I know I sure didn't stick up for her. And I look back yeah. on that time, and I mean, I think that's just as bad as saying, as being the mean girl. I have looked for this woman everywhere. I, you know, probably every six months, I will go on a Google search and try to figure out where she is. And, you know, she probably has a different last name now, but I really, 
I right. I want to reach out to her, but I've even thought if I found her, would she just be like, fuck you? You know, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Or she might be like, you know, my life turned out great. Yeah, I would. Um, I, I just feel horrible guilt, horrible guilt, like, like really bad. So Denise well, Marks, if you are out there, I am so <laughs> sorry. I mean, I, I remember it like it was last week. So and and I think it is because we're all so much more aware of Mean Girls now, you know, because it's I mean, right. the mo- the Tina Fey movie and, you know, just more right. that we hear about bullying and uh, that, that you know what? So let, let's kind of wrap this up with this. Let's talk about okay. women over 45 and their friendships. And I think that we can say at this point in life that the Mean Girl I think we're all so much more compassionate with each other about life. I think women just hopefully we're really there for each other right now. Absolutely. (laughs) Sticking up for each other and defending one another Um, with all the stuff that happened back in high school. It made me a nicer, better person. And I'll thank them for that. It taught me how to not treat people and to stick up for those people that can't. And I try to teach that to my son who's seven it's so hard. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with boys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> boys just, I like, think it made me more compassionate and I have tried to teach my children to be more compassionate. How about you, Kim? Well, I also think that when you talk about when you get into your late 40s and 50s, you have this perspective on, you know, what what's really important. And so, you know, being able to fit into a skinny skirt isn't important anymore. And I, I actually, um, I have a full-time job and I have this, uh, saying with, with the folks that I work with, this is not really an emergency. This may be important. It may be a deadline, but this is not an emergency. Take a deep breath. Like we have some perspective here. Like no one is going to, no one is bleeding or dying, right? Like this is, you know, this is, this is manageable. And I think just in general, when you get to a certain point in your life, you get that perspective where it's like, there aren't really, there are no few real emergencies. Real emergencies are when people are sick. Real emergencies are when, you know, you got to go flying off to the hospital. I think that is, and that happens also with my girlfriends. Like when we go out and, you know, and we're talking about different things, like who cares, you know, what color somebody's hair is. You know, it just doesn't matter anymore. Those aren't the things that matter in life at all. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't think it's until you get to middle age that you actually kind of get that. Well, and I, I know that sounds incredibly condescending because when like 20 year olds hear that, they're like, oh, I don't want to hear one more time that you're smart and I'm not. It's like, it's not, it's not that you're not smart. It's just that you're in a different place. When you get to middle age, it's a completely different perspective. Yeah. Well, and and to, to take that another, and I love that you said that and to take it one step further, I think that when we get to this age, we see the huge difference that teeny tiny little things can make in someone else's life. Like picking up, like when you talk about important versus urgent, it is important to do things like pick up the phone and call your mother or your aunt, yeah. or your friend. I mean, those little stupid, no-brainer things have a huge impact on other people's lives. I absolutely agree. Awesome. All right, we're going to wrap it up here, ladies. I so appreciate... Already? Oh. Yes, all, it's, it's that time already. And so what I'm going to do is... Folks, if you go to the show notes at experience50.com slash 170, you're going to find all the links. I'm also going to give you guys a way to link to Amanda. It'll take you to Audible to all of her narrated books. Her voice is so smooth and so lovely. And I can tell you, having spent hours and hours (laughs) with her in my ear, it was a treat. It was a it was an ear bath. <laughs> Thanks. Am- so I know, didn't it? <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda. And Kim, do you have any last words that you would like to share with my listeners about what you love about being 55, almost 56? 
I guess the the I'm glad that I'm here, right? You, like alive. Like, yeah. <laughs> Year very recently, my high school speech and debate coach died, and she was such a monumental part of my high school life. She had this wonderful memorial, and we all kind of got together. Several hundred people talking about what it was like to have her as our speech and debate coach. A universal theme was like we were all looking around the room, like, "Hey, who's still here?" Right? Like, who's still amongst us? And when you start pushing, especially sixty-ish, you start looking at, "Wow, just I'm just happy to still be breathing in oxygen and hanging out." And I think you become very um, aware and appreciative of that as you get older. So, yeah, I'm just. I'm just glad to sort of still be making a difference. Excellent. I know every morning when I wake up and my feet hit the floor, it's a win. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) All right, ladies, you (laughs) you are awesome. The name of the book is I Was in Love with a Short Man Once. Our guests have been Kim Delfries, who is the author and the narrator, Amanda Newcomb. Thanks, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was super fun. I want to thank both Amanda and Kim. I want to thank you guys for listening to the podcast. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to take us out listening to the very funny blooper reel of Amanda trying to say Askew's erection. It's very fun. I just love listening to her laugh. But before I run that, I want to just send out some thanks to some very special people who are contributing to the show through Patreon. So a great big thanks to Regina J., Susan M., Janine G., Caroline L., Karen A., Mark R., Christine P., Carol M., Jane T., Mark V., Joan M., Nancy B., Jan W., Karen D., Dave M, Craig B, Corridan F, Candy C, Tim H, and Nancy P. You guys rock. All right. Have a great week. You've got this. Bye. One for the House and one for the Senate. The finished product was dubbed. <laughs> the finished the finished product was dubbed Askew's Erection. <laughs> After good. <laughs> Oh. Oh. The finished product was dubbed Askew's Erection after Governor after Governor Urban Askew Askew's Erection Askew's Sorry Woo